And speaking of writing, we're very proud to bring these next two young writers to the stage at Free Thought Day. Let's welcome David back to introduce these good people. David. All right, good afternoon, everybody. We are expecting two writers, but we do have one. The other one, we're not sure where she is, but that's okay. <laughs> if she gets here, I know she was driving in from Chico, so maybe she's running a little bit late. We'll put her back into the program a little bit later. But um, a couple months, no, about a year ago, about a year ago, almost right after Free Thought Day of last year, our committee decided that we wanted to try and hold our own scholarship contest to encourage young writers uh, to talk about whatever the theme might be for the coming year. And I'm proud to say that we did that. I'm, uh, I wish we could have offered more. Uh, we made it a $250 scholarship thanks to the donations of our community. Next year, maybe we can double that or add more scholarships or who knows what. And so that's part of what your donation today is going to support. I want to thank uh, Angela Garvey and Scholarship Impact uh, for helping us facilitate the scholarship. Uh, we decided on a theme and a prompt, and the prompt, of course, was based on our theme that you're hearing today about science and fake news and social media and all that good stuff. And I'm really thrilled to say that when we introduced that scholarship opportunity, we had 20 applicants, all with amazing essays. And it was tough for us to decide the winner, but of course, we did. And so, it's my proud, proud pleasure uh, to introduce to you uh, Julia Vaughn. Julia Vaughn is from Grass Valley, from Bear River High School, and she's going to come on up stage and read you her winning essay. Uh, thank you, and let's give her some applause and encouragement. Can you hear me all right? All right. Um, hello. Uh, with all the advances in technology, information can be made public before the eyes of billions of online users simply with the click of a button. The stream of data is continuous and ever-growing, with new files being uploaded within mere milliseconds of one another. This articulation of data is exponential, and due to the sheer speed of availability, it's not as if this information can be uh, monitored and fact-checked. Coming across the articles of fake news is practically unavoidable. There just aren't enough moderators to be able to track each specific data packet weaving in between networks. Uh, um, attempting to decipher which are accurate and which possess faulty information. Social media has become such a prominent factor in our daily lives. The notification buzzes from various apps stored within our phones, acting as calling cards and stealing our attention away from other tasks. In pockets, it's impossible to miss the rectangular impression of a mobile device jetting from just about every passerby. It's undoubtable that technology is the future and that nearly every aspect of life is now dependent upon Wi-Fi connections and cellular towers. This connection, however, also, leave, also leaves us susceptible to the sharing of misinformation. Faulty headlines can dance upon our feeds. Their setup's convincing, yet nonetheless false. When fallacious claims become perceived as the truth, it can lead to catastrophe. Fake news is everywhere nowadays, and it can become harder and harder to pull the truth from the lies. My proposition is utilizing our advanced technology to weed out these articles of misinformation. Many social media sites already possess algorithms for advertising purposes. So why not start creating ones that focus on flagging posts that might not be completely truthful? Deleting these posts could become a violation of the First Amendment. However, marking questionable content with warnings that the following information is potentially disseminating faulty facts could help prevent the spread of so-called fake news upon unsuspecting viewers. Using algorithms that compare topics of interest to well-trusted news sites discussing similar topics could help detect discrepancies between the two. This could then mean that the post is forwarded to a moderator and to check over and either debunk or confirm the article to be inconsistent and personally award the article a warning or simply have the algorithm finish the process itself. Of course, it's impossible to stop all fake news. More and more will just continue to overflow servers for years to come. However, if companies work progressively in attempting to deter this information in whatever ways possible, just a little fake let, let just a little less fake news could be really helpful in getting the truth out there and stopping the lies. 
the people that deserve to know what is truly happening within their physical world. And as such, preserving and protecting what true information out is out there should be a priority. Thank you. Yeah, and so on behalf of uh, the California Free Thought Day, uh, thank you so much for your winning essay. And here is a little bit to go towards your uh, college education. Thank you so much. All right. Occasionally I make mistakes. Apparently Sarah was here in the audience. They just never told me. And so, <laughs> um, so I am happy to say we're back on program and our second essayist is about to come up. Uh, now this is a really interesting situation. First I want to ask, is Robert Nicholson here in the audience? Robert, are you here? You are here? Now this gentleman that's standing up and raising his hand, I want to give you, sir, um, some proper credit. Uh, you may have picked up on this story on Hemet's blog, The Friendly Atheist, when he tried to offer a substantial scholarship for a similar idea uh, to his local high school and uh, he found out that no one took him up. No one even, how much was it originally, like $3,000 or $2,500? He offered a $2,500 scholarship for an essay about religious uh, or, or being an atheist or something like that. No one responded. And he inquired, why? Why is there at least one person who's going to try and get this money? Turns out that the school didn't want to tell anyone about the scholarship. So he found out. Oh, he also like upped it to like another four to, to four thousand dollars, and uh, and then made some phone calls and got angry. And I don't blame you. And uh, eventually they did offer it. And because of that amazingly generous uh, opportunity, uh, Sarah Hagee had uh, entered in and wrote an amazing, brilliant essay. Uh, and so while uh, I wish we could have given more money out, I just got to thank you uh, for, for contributing so much. Uh, let's give Mr. Robert Nicholson a, a, a round of applause uh, for providing a $4,000 scholarship to Sarah from uh, Winters High School. Uh, she's going to Solano Community College and she's going to major in sociology. To read her essay, let's welcome Sarah Hagee. Uh, first and foremost, I'd like to thank Robert Nicholson and his family for having provided the scholarship opportunity, as well as David for inviting me to my first ever secular event. The day I told my father I didn't want to go to church anymore, I may as well have turned into Satan himself. For hours I tried to explain how I don't agree with the church's teachings, but he wasn't budging. I was just another brainwashed liberal with, that gathered all my ideologies from the internet. While parents tend to be the last people you want to disappoint, I was tired of being shoved into a box of religion. They always told me it's about relationship with God and not religion, but failed to adhere to the fact that they were still following a religion based on a book written more than 2,000 years ago, at least. My parents were not always churchgoers. Eight years ago, my father began to attend with my older brother, eventually letting my little brother and I tag along, and soon enough, my mother was convinced too. In the beginning, it was pleasant. Everybody hugged me, spoke positively, occasionally provided free donuts for the youth, and so on. However, I was far too young to actually understand religion. I just figured, these people are nice, and I like this. As I grew older into my teenage years, I admit I became skeptical. Acknowledging the fact that I'm not speaking on behalf of, the, of all churches across the nation, I'd like to talk about my personal church and the hypocrisies that were all too common. For a religion that claimed to love everybody and treat everybody equally, there were more cliques than a high school drama movie. Trying to make friends was hard. Girls would stare at me like I was dirty, unworthy of their time, and seemed quite comfortable with the friends that they had so I didn't bother to make approaches anymore. There was a silent hierarchy, the friends and family of pastors at the top, young, in, young adult interns in the middle, and everybody else at the bottom. Understanding where I fit in, I began to develop this kind of resentment for feeling that I was constantly alienated. For reasons unknown, I found that there's a huge mental health stigma in the church. When I came to my mother with such problems, at about age 15, the answer seemed to be that I needed more Jesus. And for a short time, I believed that. 
I believe that my chemical imbalance was just me not being a good Christian and that the enemy was working his ways. But with the Jesus, Jesus can heal you mentality, wouldn't that mean Jesus was the one who gave me the illness in the first place? Anyways, when I wanted to begin medication treatment, my father was clearly uncomfortable with the idea. Personally, I was tired of trying to tough it out, so I was willing to try just about anything. He eventually came into it, understanding I had to do what I thought was best for me, but still, every so often, my parents would tell me to just give it all to God. Ultimately, I found there was a superficial mantra of positivity in church that I couldn't get over. Having a God that can take away depression and lack of motivation at the snap of his fingers sounds awesome, but there's also Prozac and Zoloft that can do the job. In the church world, there didn't seem to be much talk about the LGBT community. Their beliefs were typically only said out loud when you spoke to them personally. And whenever marriage was brought up during a sermon, you could hear the vindication in their voice when the pastor said, between a man and a woman. And the masses so close-mindedly repeated, amen. Up until my sophomore year of high school, I only started to begin to understand the gender spectrum, the difficulties that the LGBT community faces, and how unjust it was overall. Not only was I appalled, but after putting much thought into my own sexuality, I could no longer be complacent with how the church treated and judged these individuals. I hit a rather awkward time in my life about a year ago where I began to admire young, another young woman. It didn't feel wrong, but I felt incredibly lost concerning I, I knew nothing about heterosexual relationships. Nothing came of it, but I pondered for a long time about why the church was against homosexual relationships. Was I not allowed to be happy with whomever? Are straight men the only people that can make me feel love and happiness? It seemed a little misogynistic to me. I've never talked with anyone in my family about my sexuality because I feel there are the people to think I'm in a phase or just confused, and don't get me wrong, my parents are not what I would call blatantly homophobic, but it's definitely understood where they stand on the belief itself. There's so many beautiful people in the world and I'm strictly limited to men. Lame. <laughs> all jokes aside, I came to the conclusion that I could not support an organization that did not accept all walks of sexuality. Within the past few weeks, I have become more comfortable questioning my beliefs. Initially, I felt guilty, extremely guilty. Even now, my mother's initial reaction to me writing this essay for a scholarship was that it wasn't worth it and how could a family promote this? I haven't completely opened up to my parents about my atheism and the only thing stopping me is the thought of disappointing them. Nevertheless, my life has felt free. I no longer spend my days worrying about being punished by God or force myself to sit through those sanctimonious Sunday sermons. My parents and I have a loving relationship, but the tension and awkwardness remains. If church has taught me anything, it's definitely that there is a comfortability found in religion. Putting faith in a higher power and believing in a life after death certainly makes living a lot more tolerable. On the opposite end of the spectrum, it's a very lonely, sobering feeling to consider that we as mankind are just coincidences, embodiments of energy and atoms from the Big Bang floating through an infinite universe. Thank you. Julia and Sarah, that was beautiful. Both of you, thank you so much. And Robert, again, thank you for being so generous. All right. And oh, and Scholarship Impact and uh, Angela Garvey, thank you so much for facilitating that.